Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very grateful for that fantastic reception. Happens every time I walk into a lecture theatre. Um, uh, tonight's speaker in the latest of our In Conversation series is Jacob Rees-Mogg. Um, he's been the MP for North East Somerset uh, since 2010. He's a member of the Exiting the EU Committee of the House of Commons and head of the European Research Group. Um, he is also, and I suspect this is at least in part why you're here, currently the bookies uh, favourite to be the next Conservative leader. Uh, and, uh, and, and actually, according to the Conservative Home Survey, which was out today, you're also the members' current favourite to be leader. Um, and that piece says, by the way, that they, they initially didn't used to put you on the surveys, but they had to add your name because people kept writing your name in, so they've ended up having to put your name on, on the poll they run. Well, my mother's very technologically sophisticated, <laughs> she's busy. Um, now, the format of this event is the same as all the other ones that we've run. Uh, we will chat for sort of 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, you will grow increasingly frustrated at my inability to ask a pointed uh, question, uh, and that I resemble Jimmy Young, some of you will remember uh, far more than Jeremy Paxman. Uh, after that point, we will throw it open to you, and you can ask the pointed, laser-sharp question that you've been preparing for the last 30 or 40 minutes. Um, so let me start, uh, first by pouring you a drink, and secondly, without giving away any secrets and about other people we've invited to this series to speak, you're the only one we've had to employ an overflow lecture theatre for, and you're the only one where the event sold out within a couple of hours. Um, what is it about someone who's been an MP for seven years and never held ministerial office, or even been on his own party's front bench, that draws a crowd like that? Well, I put it entirely down to your organisation and the fact that people want to come and hear you. <laughs> uh, uh, and that as the series has grown, more people want to come along. Um, uh, it's very hard to see oneself as others see one. However hard one tries, and it's one of the great aims that one should have in life, to try and understand what do other people see positively and negatively about one's own attributes, which is quite difficult to analyse. And so the honest answer is I don't really know why people want to come. I can only guess. And my guess would be the hope that I might say something slightly controversial, but perhaps, <laughs> perhaps most importantly that I'll say what I think. And therefore, if you ask me a question, with a bit of luck, I'll answer it without particularly thinking whether spin doctors would think that was a good answer or not. And I have a feeling that there is a desire in politics for uh, less controlled answers, more straightforward answers, that people can then engage with and argue back about. I mean, I'm very flattered that there are protesters outside. That's great, because they want to engage in political debate. And that's really important, because I think my arguments are good arguments. And if I can engage in debate, I might be able to persuade people that conservatism is worth supporting. OK, well, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can hold you to that answering questions as we proceed through best. for the next hour and, and a bit. Let's talk about the protest outside, because you are simultaneously maybe the, the most popular speaker we've invited to come along in the series since we've been running it for a year and a bit. But you're also the only one that's attracted a protest. Um, so if I read to you the, the leaflet that was circulated from the um, Socialist Worker <laughs> Student Society, um, you are apparently on the most reactionary wing of the Tory party. Uh, you're against abortion even in case of rape. You've been a staunch opponent of gay marriage. You're against the rights of EU nationals to stay. You voted against laws to promote equality and human rights. And you're a warmonger who voted against investigations into the Iraq war. Uh, it goes on. To be fair, it goes on quite a lot. I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase. Okay. But <laughs> it, this is our campus, it says, and we shouldn't be inviting politicians who are against the welfare and freedom of our diverse student and staff body. Uh, you're not welcome at Queen Mary as a pro-LGBT, pro-choice and anti-racist campus. And then there's a picture of you in a top hat. <laughs> um, do you recognise, when you say that you, you sometimes struggle to see people as others see you, do you recognise yourself in that description? Um, well, I'm sorry I didn't wear a top hat. Um, I didn't realise it was compulsory. Had I done so, I'd, I'd obviously brought one along. Um, some things they say are simply wrong. 
that when you come to EU citizens, I said during the referendum campaign that I thought we should say, regardless of whether uh, or what point we left, that anyone who was here legally should be welcome. And I actually think this is really important because, to my mind, people who have left their home and left their family, moved hundreds of miles to a country where they don't speak the language, to work hard and contribute to our society, and did so lawfully under laws we had passed, should be admired and respected, not treated as if they're not welcome. So European member state citizens who have come to the UK, we should admire and value and protect all their rights. So on that, it's simply wrong. On the inquiry into the Iraq war, there was one vote in Parliament when I was there, whilst the Chilcot inquiry was already going on. It's on theyworkforyou.com, and there were lots of votes when Tony Blair and Gordon Brown were in charge, which Labour routinely voted against. I was all in favour of an inquiry into um, the Iraq war. I'm not a warmonger. I've had grave doubts about what the government uh, decided to do uh, in Libya um, and in Syria. And so I think it's just, some of it's just mere abuse. But do I believe in the sanctity of life? Do I believe that life begins at the point of conception? Yes, very strongly, I do believe that. I think that is when a person is created. And that if you believe life begins at that point, then can you really say it's reasonable to take it? I don't believe in capital punishment either, for exactly the same reason I don't think it's right for the state to take life. Um, of all the things I wanted to talk to you about, the one that I was absolutely determined I was not going to raise, because it seemed to me it had been covered remorselessly in almost any interview I'd read with you over the last couple of years, was the, the nappy thing. <laughs> but but every t almost everybody I've said, oh, I'm doing this interview with Jacob, they've said, oh, what about the nappy? So it has clearly struck a chord with people. And... As I understand it, your position is that despite having six children, you've never changed a nappy. And that's because, in your view, that's the nanny's job. And the nanny would be uh, disgruntled with you were you to attempt to, to change a nappy because that's her job and you wouldn't do it very well. Is that, is that a fair summary? It's slightly more nuanced than that. You must bear in mind, the nanny we're talking about is my nanny, who's worked for my family for 52 years and still pretty much thinks of me as one of the children she's looking after. So... Um, uh, uh, Nanny's views of these things are quite firmly held. Um, you'd be amazed by how many men I've spoken to have either said to me, they've never changed any nappies either, or lucky me. Uh, I, I, I do recognise that I'm in a fortunate position, um, but it's absolutely true. Nanny would not think it was a good idea for me to be changing nanny, nappies. She thinks it's her job. And people do take a pride in their job. And I think it's important not to uh, interfere in other people's roles. But does that mean your wife hasn't changed a nappy either? Oh, no, no. My wife's definitely changed lots of nappies. <laughs> you'll, you'll see where I'm going with this. Why, why is it OK for your wife... I mean, I understand the argument that says we employ the nanny, the nanny yeah. changes the nappy. But why is it OK for your wife to do it, but not for well, you to do it? I, I, um, I'm not sure Nanny's too delighted that anybody other than Nanny changes nappies, but... It's simply the practicalities uh, of life. But bear in mind, I'm not in a great deal of the time. I'm coming and doing things like this. It's not as if I'm at home uh, 24 hours a day, whereas my, my wife is a, is a stay-at-home mother. Um, you also said in, in one of these discussions about the nappy, you said, I've made no pretense to be a modern man at all, ever. Um, a, a sentiment I, I understand, but objectively you are a modern man, aren't you? I mean, we are actually almost identical ages. I'm, I'm a month older than you. Um, and I have to say, I, I'm loving this because most of my life I feel very crusty and old. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, now, I'm now in the role of a sort of metrosexual hipster. Uh, <laughs> which... <laughs> but but you, are, you are, you know, we are modern men, aren't we? we you, you can't pretend to be a throwback to the 18th century. We are of the age that we are in, and I will confess my cover was pretty much blown yesterday when I was at the Dexu Select Committee, and I looked down at my suit and saw that it was absolutely covered in my two-year-old's breakfast, that I had made the mistake of picking him out of his high chair, and really, 
to do. I don't know how Nanny allowed me to do this. I got permission, but nonetheless. <laughs> and all his breakfast had appeared on my suit. So inevitably we are of the era that we are and can't live in a, in a different era. I, I think what I'm really trying to get across by saying I don't pretend to be a modern man is I don't pretend to be anything other than what I am or who I am. Um, that there isn't a, a facade that I'm putting forward and that if we were sitting at home and having this discussion, my answers would be exactly the same. It, it's not something that I bring out for when I, when I come to Queen Mary's College. Um, maybe a, a few questions about Brexit, not least because you were in the news today on this subject. Uh, at Questions Today, you made the claim when asking the ministers that Charles Grant of the Centre for European Research had said that officials in the Treasury, these are your words, have deliberately developed a model to show that all options other than staying in the customs union are bad and that officials attend to use the model to influence policy. Now, Charles Grant of the Centre for European Research has flatly denied he made any such allegation and the audio of the meeting at which he's supposed to have said this has now been released and he clearly doesn't make that allegation. So do you, do you withdraw the allegation that officials at the Treasury are deliberately developing a model to show that options other than the Customs Union are bad. Well, it's quite interesting because you put out a tweet a few months before this meeting basically saying exactly the point I raised with the Minister. And I have retweeted that. If people want to have a look at it, it was picked up by Guido Fawkes uh, that he had said that the Treasury um, was trying to soften the Brexit policy. And, and so... Um, I had heard this rumour, and therefore I asked the minister, because it was at a meeting the minister was at. Uh, the minister's memory of the meeting was that this had been said. Um, I wasn't there, so I don't know, and I never pretended to know, but it's very much in line with what Charles Grant tweeted uh, in, in July. So um, it, it, it is a worrying suspicion, and I think on this whole issue, the thing I'm really concerned about is that you get... A week ago, the CBI coming out saying it's really important we stay in the customs union. You get that the Chancellor in Davos saying the CBI is absolutely brilliant, or the EU-funded CBI, as we ought to call it, uh, is a wonderful organisation and we should have as modest a Brexit as possible and remain closely aligned. And then a few days after that, you have a leak of a Treasury-designed economic model that says the only thing to do is stay in the customs union. You just wonder whether there isn't a pattern in that, whether there isn't some orchestration rather than being an accidental constellation of the stars. But, but there may be some orchestration in those elements, and it may even be that uh, Charles Grant's claim, which he made in the tweet you referred to, which is that the Treasury wanted us to stay in the customs union and was putting pressure, officials were putting pressure on. That's one thing. Your claim was slightly different, which was that they had deliberately developed a model in order to produce results that would end up arguing that case. Now, that's a, that's a much more specific claim, and that's the claim that Charles Grant says well, he didn't make. OK. Um, if he says he didn't make it, um, he says he didn't make it, but he made a very similar claim on Twitter. Um, but if you look at the facts of what the Treasury is doing, they have produced something that models uh, various scenarios for our trade that assumes we would apply the common external tariff to our trading partners once we've left the um, customs union. Well, this is absolutely bonkers. No government in its right mind would put tariffs on, higher tariffs than there already are, on food, clothing and footwear. It would simply make the standard of living of people in this country worse, for no benefit to this country. Why would any government do that? So the underlying assumptions of what the Treasury uh, is producing its forecast based upon are designed to produce a bad outcome from the forecast. It's exactly what they did prior to the referendum, so it is of a piece. So what Charles Grant said or didn't say at a lunch doesn't really matter very much, and I never claimed to have heard it. No. What does matter is that he broadly indicated this in a tweet, it fits in uh, with the facts, and it's why you can be so suspicious of these forecasts, because they are designed to a particular end, and the end is to show the only thing we should do, lo and behold, is stay in the customs union, which basically means not leaving the European Union. Okay, so it is your belief that, even if Charles Grant didn't say this, it is your belief that civil servants are deliberately producing evidence in order to skew the 
outcome of these discussions? Well, I think the blame always has to lie with ministers, actually. And we knew very clearly before the uh, Brexit vote that the Treasury was being guided very strongly by the then Chancellor of the Exchequer. And I think it's the Chancellor of the Exchequer who has to take responsibility for his department. OK. Um, about a week ago, you had what well, I thought was a very interesting exchange with uh, David Davis at the um, Select Committee hearing, where you were pushing him on why the government didn't simply extend Article 50. Uh, if, if not all of the negotiations can be achieved in time, rather than going into some sort of transitional or implementation stage, the government should simply push back Article 50. Now, he had an argument for why he didn't want to do that. But what I wasn't entirely clear about from the meeting was whether you were advocating your view or whether you were just trying to tease out the government's position. Is it your view that given where we currently are, the government should be extending Article 50? No, I was merely posing the question. And fortunately, since that exchange, the government's position has to some extent been clarified so that the Prime Minister is now saying we will leave the um, requirement for free movement of people. And that's a very important part of having left the European Union. And therefore, people who come after the date we've left will not have the same rights as those before. And that they are looking at a system, and the Prime Minister said this a couple of days ago, where we will not automatically accept new laws from the European Union. So if we're not accepting new laws, if we're out of the free movement of people, then the 30th of March is different from the 29th of March 2019. I was just posing the question, if this wasn't happening, which is what it seemed like when David Davis came before the committee, then were they not going to look at the argument about simply extending it? But it was never my preferred option. My preferred option has always been that we should leave on the 29th of March and it should be an implementation period implementing the decision to leave rather than a transition period where you're transitioning from being a member to not being a member. Um, before the last election, you, you called for a pact with, between the Conservative Party and UKIP. Um, now, before the last election, before but the, one. The, the last, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, now, UKIP have imploded somewhat since then. Uh, but there's still a sizable UKIP vote out there, still UKIP members. Um, what would your message be today to UKIP members or UKIP voters after the last couple of weeks that they and their leader have had? <laughs> Dear me, um, I'm, I'm not sure I want to dwell on private grief, um, but I would, I would advise UKIP voters to join the Conservative Party and vote for the Conservative Party because the Conservative Party um, is heading towards delivering Brexit. It may not provide everything in the transition period, but as long as the end state is clear that we are really leaving the European Union, that means the single market and the customs union uh, as well, then actually the Conservative Party is doing the main thing that UKIP exists for. What I think is really interesting is that UKIP was so dependent on the charisma of Nigel Farage and that without him as leader, UKIP has never been able to recapture the momentum he created. Um, also today in the Commons, as well as the question that you took part in, there was a debate about um, introducing a, f a form of maternity and paternity leave for MPs, which at the moment doesn't exist. Now, the, the, the details of this are still to be resolved, um, and today's vote was only in indicative, but I just, are you sympathetic to the general issue the idea that uh, we need some form of maternity leave for parliamentarians. Yes, I'm extremely sympathetic to the idea of maternity leave. Uh, and as long as it's voluntary, um, I have no objection to paternity leave. Why I say as long as it's voluntary, I'd have been off for two years after the last seven if it had been compulsory and you'd had six months every time. If it had been a year every time, I'd been off for four, year, four years out of seven and I wouldn't be much of an MP. And I, I don't think you should set it in such a way as that MPs feel that they've either got to be an MP or to have children. But you really want to make the House of Commons a place where women feel welcome and fully able to do the job of an MP. And therefore, all the support that is suggested to provide uh, an extra researcher, somebody who can do uh, the administrative work of an MP, I completely support. The thing I have my doubt about is proxy voting. Because I think as soon as you allow an MP to appoint a proxy, why not then for... Uh, an MP who's 
ill and can't come into the House of Commons for that reason? What about a Prime Minister who's in China uh, and can't come in? And once you have a proxy for one reason, then doesn't it make it sensible to have it for a lot of other reasons? But actually, that vote of an MP is a very personal thing that can't be uh, divided from the individual MP. How do we get around this, then? Because, I mean, I, I might share some of these concerns. I mean, we, I, it seems to me we don't want to go down the route of the New Zealand Parliament, where the whips cast votes on behalf of parliamentarians. But there is a problem at the moment with particularly women who have maternity leave. They don't vote. Their voting record drops. Then they get pilloried in the newspaper for being the laziest MP in existence oh, yeah. or whatever. And I'm not sure how we get around that issue if we don't allow some form of proxy voting. Well, I, I think we need to... TheyWorkForYou.com is a very useful website. It's a very interesting website, but it's not perfect in what it reports. But it would be very easy for it to give a 100% attendance record to women who were on a maternity leave. And it would just have a footnote, or it would say, and that's not a difficult thing to do. It doesn't need legislation to do it. They could do it voluntarily. They could say any MP who notifies us that, we are, that they are on maternity or paternity leave will be deemed to maintain their average voting record. It seems to me to be perfectly fair. And the truth is that most votes in the House of Commons, whether any individual MP turns up or not, doesn't actually matter. That the government will get its business, there's a pairing system. Um, I've been on the DEXU committee, and uh, for the first few months I was on it, one Conservative MP was off on maternity leave, and one Labour MP was off on maternity leave. It therefore balanced out, and this is often true out of the 650 MPs, that the government won't be dependent on women on maternity leave turning up to vote. There may be the really exceptional cases, and these are the occasions when the whips have people brought in by ambulance, you know, people who are dying, you, you know, particularly all the stuff around 1979, and, then, and what happened then, and to make sure that the government could keep going. Um, under those circumstances, if people who are on their deathbed are coming in on a very exceptional basis, I don't think it's that unreasonable for women who've had babies to come in on the same basis. Um, what about the more general idea that the composition of the House of Commons <coughs> matters? I mean, are you sympathetic to the idea that we have a problem in terms of the type of people who are becoming MPs? And that, bluntly, there are too many people like me and you in the House of Commons, and the place would be better if it was more diverse. Um, I think the work of Baroness Jenkin and Women to Win has been tremendously important, because what it's done for the Conservative Party is persuade women of the highest calibre that what they want to do is be members of parliament. And that's brought really, really first-class people in. And I think that's so much more important than saying we must have a quota. I think what you want to do is persuade people that their ambition is to become a member of parliament. And you want to do that from as wide a variety of backgrounds as possible. Um, I'll whisper this quietly, but you don't want everybody in the House of Commons to be like me. It would be frightfully boring if they were all like me, and um, if everyone was like me, I wouldn't have got a crowd to turn up, would I? Because you'd all be the same as every other MP. You need variety, you need diversity, but you should do that because that's what people want to do and because the parties persuade good people from different backgrounds to throw their hat into the ring, not because you legislate or the parties insist on quotas or particular shortlists. And, and if you had to come up with a couple of characteristics that you're particularly concerned about, what groups are you worried about in particular that are absent, either completely or disproportionately from the House of Commons at the moment? Uh, the, the people who are probably the least represented are the poorest in society. And, and I, I think that y you, you want to get people who have... Um, uh, uh, most people in the House of Commons are... And once you get there, of course, you're paid. But most people have a relatively comfortable history. And I think we need to be able, and as I understand um, you've done here, get people who've come from very deprived backgrounds to come to the House of Commons to bring their experience in. And that's probably the thing that is most absent. What about, I mean, recently, without going into individual details, but there's been a, quite a few cases of people whose pasts have been raked over and various things they've done in the past have come up and caused them problems. Um, to what extent does it matter what a politician 
did in their past? Or should we be more forgiving than we currently are about previous misdemeanors? Well, it's got to be contextualised and balanced. That um, um, if King Herod applied for membership of the House of Commons, you might think it was an altogether good idea. Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, somebody uh, aged 20 um, kissed somebody under the mistletoe, it's not the end of the world. Uh, and uh, I think people of my age who are relatively new to social media need to understand that people of a younger generation have put everything onto social media. And do we really want to elect people who at the age of 12 decided that they wanted to be politicians and therefore have never put anything of any kind on social media that could come back to bite them? I mean, it'd be a pretty boring lot, wouldn't it, if that's, that's what you had? And so I think we need to have some proportionality, really. And that's in the eye of the voter. Does the voter mind? And sometimes I think the voter is much more relaxed about these things uh, than fellow politicians who are endlessly in the search of a gaffe. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Conservative Party and its current <coughs> state. Um, last November you met with Steve Bannon. Um, now, leaving aside Trump, who strikes me as a unique phenomenon, uh, <laughs> what lessons do you think the Conservative Party could learn from the broader political strategy that Bannon and the people around him espoused? It, it's very interesting, the Trump phenomenon, as you say. How has be, he been so successful? One of his successes is his ability to use social media, his direct connection uh, with tens of millions of Americans, giving his views, avoiding uh, the traditional media. And the second thing, and this is um, one of the things that uh, I learned from meeting Steve Bannon, is his determination to deliver on some of the high-profile promises that he made uh, and to make sure that they happened and that they happened in the first year and that therefore he was keeping the people who put him in on side. So what do we learn from that? As Conservatives, we should be good at using social media and better than we are, but that also if we make promises in our manifesto that appeal to our voters, it's really, really important that we deliver on them because people take those promises seriously and will hold politicians to account on it. Um, Labour Party currently has somewhere over 500,000 <laughs> members. Uh, the Liberal Democrat membership is currently the highest it's ever been. Uh, Green Party membership is not quite as high as it was a couple of years ago, but still a damn sight higher than it was four or five years ago. Uh, SNP membership, as a proportion of the Scottish population, is the highest of any political party in Europe. The Conservative Party is now down, we think, to about 100,000, maybe slightly more than 100,000 people. Um, and this strikes me as an inherent problem for the party, and there's lots of evidence at the last election, that getting people out there knocking on doors matters. What can you do to reverse that trend in Conservative membership? Um, look to history. Because the Conservative Party was the first mass political movement. The Primrose League is incredibly successful at the end of the 19th century. It gets up, I think, over a million members by 1910. And then the Walton reforms get the Conservative Party to over two million members. So how did they do it? Well, uh, they did it on a grassroots basis. What's interesting about the Labour Party, actually, is that it's been a grassroots movement. It's come up from the country, not been directed from the Labour Party headquarters, and that's where momentum's come from. And what have they done? They've harnessed social media. Um, Jeremy Corbyn has, I don't know, one and a half million followers on Twitter. The Prime Minister has 400,000. So they've been more successful at doing that. They were more imaginative about social media in the last general election, and I think that's how you connect uh, more broadly with society rather than with the Conservatives' relatively um, ageing membership. Um, what else do you do? You get out and talk to people that I think one of the things we haven't been doing that we were discussing before we came in, Sam Jima came here, and that's really important that politicians should be out and about meeting voters. In the general election, it was very controlled that the Prime Minister was kept um, in a bubble to keep her away from voters, and whoever advised on that was making a mistake because it made the politicians remote. Um, but you have to get oomph to the local party so that people feel there's something on the ground worth doing, why they want to get out in the rain and deliver a leaflet, but it needs to be more than that. You need some invigoration, some excitement, some feeling that being a Tory member can 
change the world, that you contribute to policy rather than just being expecting, uh, expected to tramp the streets. And so I think we need to create an excitement about it, an energy about it, and we need to talk to people more. And one, one of the few powers that Conservative <coughs> grassroots members still have uh, are exercised in leadership elections. Um, so, not, although not at this stage, but the first stage of any leadership election in the Conservative Party at the moment would be uh, a vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister triggered by letters sent by MPs to Graham Brady, uh, the chair of the 22. Um, have you signed a letter to Graham Brady calling mm. for a vote? No, 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 I haven't. Are, are there any conditions under which you would do that? Um, not as long as Mrs May is the Prime Minister, no. I would not sign a letter calling for her to go um, that I... I think the Conservative Party gets itself into an awful muddle with leadership elections, uh, that they create an enormous amount of bitterness and very rarely lead you better off, leave you better off than you were before. I think it took the Tory party 20 years from, to recover from the decapitation of Margaret Thatcher. And I think that... I think you could argue it still hasn't. You, you could argue that. It's, it's not an unreasonable yeah. argument, actually. Um, uh, and 20 years was a relatively arbitrary yeah. cut-off. And so I think it, that... Um, Mrs May has set out clearly what she's aiming to achieve with Brexit in her Lancaster House speech, Tory party manifesto, slightly watered down by Florence, but not impossibly so, something that <coughs> people like me could live with. Um, and it's worth supporting her to do that and recognising some of the difficulties that would be faced by any leader with a very small majority. That it's all very well saying there should be the smack of firm government, but if the smack of firm government comes up with a parliamentary defeat, it doesn't look strong, it looks weak. And the Prime Minister every day and the Chief Whip have to balance whether they can get something through the House of Commons. And if they can't, they're better off not proposing it. So in the event that there is a vote of no confidence, you would support the Prime Minister in that? I'm effect. supporting the Prime Minister, yes. In the event that she did not, either stood down or was defeated in such a vote and there was a vacancy, um, to return to what we were discussing right at the beginning when the Conservative Home website discovered that you were the, currently the, the party member's favourite... Um, your line on this, as I understand it, is there is no vacancy. Um, but you could follow General Sherman, who famously said, if drafted, I will not run. <laughs> if nominated, I will not accept. And if elected, I will not serve. I mean, you could rule out the possibility that under any circumstances would you run for the Conservative leadership. Uh, I think, once again, one can look at history. Um, no leader... Well, well, General Sherman is it, a it, historical yep, yep, figure. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, Tanks have been named after him. Um, uh, but I'm a backbench member of Parliament, and uh, in government, no backbencher has ever gone on to be leader of the Conservative Party. It has happened in opposition. But in government, the Conservative Party, since Stanley Baldwin, has always gone for somebody who has been Chancellor, Foreign Secretary, or Home Secretary. And the reason for that is that it used to be chosen, as you know, by the magic circle, um, but is now chosen by parliamentary colleagues, and they always go for a senior cabinet minister. So I think it's better, rather than dealing with what um, I might say or not, to deal with the practicalities. And the practicalities of the backbench MP, it is very hard to see how I could be a candidate of any seriousness. No, it's not. It's very easy to see how you could become a candidate. You only, because the rules uh, now are different to the rules in 1963 or 1955, and so it would be very possible for you to become a candidate. You would merely have to be in the last two of the parliamentary party and then go out to the grassroots, where you are currently the favourite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's very flattering to be the favourite of the grassroots. I mean, genuinely, that... that um, I greatly appreciate the confidence that people are showing in me and I hope I can use that to advance the political ideas that I believe in. But you have to be voted through by members of parliament, um, conservative members of parliament, to get to that last two who expect to be voting for a minister. And that's where history's always been. So, okay, so you... In which case, were you not to be a minister? And obviously in a few years' time you may be a minister... But were you not to be a minister, you wouldn't stand because there would be no point in you standing? I can see no circumstances where a non-minister would be likely to be a serious candidate. OK. Um, well, final couple of questions and then we will throw it open to the audience. Um, 
You did an, an interview the other day in which you said you'd never been to Ikea. Hmm. <laughs> and I, How many of you thought I was regularly in Ikea, <laughs> if you thought about this at all? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not Mr. Flatpak. Um, <laughs> McDonald's. Have you ever been to a McDonald's? I have. I actually quite like McDonald's. <laughs> Uh, Weatherspoons. Have you ever been in a Weatherspoons? I've been to a Weatherspoons, yes. <laughs> so it's a great Eurosceptic train, so all go and drink, <laughs> drink your beer in Weatherspoons. Nando's. Never been to Nando's, no. no, no, no. Uh, Greg's. Yes, yes. Ah, now, if you want to get the best cream buns, mm -hmm. go to the Greggs in the High Street in Canesham. It's actually, if you want to know all my secrets, this is my Friday treat when I've got a day in the constituency. Um, I go into Greggs and buy for my agent and for myself um, cream buns. I usually have a chocolate eclair or one of those very gooey shoe buns. I, anyway, they're, they're jolly good. And the last of these, Lidl. I've never been into Lidl. Right. I could have, guess, I could have guessed that. And, and, and the, two, the two questions I always ask to round up, and then we will throw it open to the audience. Um, when you were growing up, who was your political hero? Oh, um, I mean, when I was very little, and this is a dark secret, uh, it was Harold Wilson. But that was because um, he was our... We lived in London in Smith Square, and he was living in Lord North Street. And having the Prime Minister living a few doors away from you was really quite exciting. But then I realised he wanted to take uh, all our money away, and I thought this wasn't <laughs> quite a good idea. Um, and um, from then on, my great political hero was unquestionably Margaret Thatcher. The, 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 um, the clarity of thought and of purpose, the drive, the energy. She was a most exciting leader. And the last question before we throw it over to the audience. If you had a piece of advice to give to a young, uh, aspiring politician, what would that advice be? Perseverance. Um, when I was applying for seats, I lost count of the number of seats I applied for. And by the time I was applying to North East Somerset, Central Office, Conservative Central Office was absolutely desperate to stop me being selected. And that if you want to get on in politics, it's, you can, but you have to keep going. You have to throw your hat into the ring again and again and again until people get bored of throwing your hat back at you. And that would be the advice I'd, I would give really strongly to all of you. People I knew at university, cleverer than me, more political than me, all those qualities that would have made them brilliant MPs, but not perseverance. And if you've got perseverance, then you will get through uh, in, in, into the House of Commons.